All right. Welcome, everyone. I am Paul Ferraro uh, at Johns Hopkins University in the United States. I'll be doing the introduction today. I'm joined by my co-host, Johanna Eklund from the University of Helsinki, who's going to moderate the panel today, and Sebastian costa from Conservation International, who's going to moderate the question and answer uh, session. So this is our seventh webinar in the series, and as I'll be talking about at the very end, we're going to continue doing it next year. We've had a great response, and so I want to thank everyone uh, who's registered, who's been participating. Uh, it's been uh, great to see so much uh, interest in this, so we will be keeping it going. And today we're doing something a little different. The other six webinars were single presenters. Today we're doing a panel, but the structure is going to be very similar. So if you haven't been to one of our webinars, we're going to start with the speaker, in this case the panel, for about 30 minutes, followed by a moderated question and answer session. And for the moderated question and answer session, you can post your questions in the chat, and we encourage you to do that throughout. That way Sebastian has some time to look at the questions before the, the session begins. It's a very friendly audience, so you should feel very comfortable putting in your questions in there. Uh, you probably are not alone with those questions. If you have a question, others likely also have that uh, same uh, question. So uh, if you find it helpful, you can activate the live transcription function in Zoom. If you look at the menu ribbon under more, you can find a live transcript that will give you a closed caption. If you have to leave early, or you know someone who would love to hear this panel but couldn't be here today, all the seminars are recorded. You can find them at the Society for Conservation Biology's Vimeo channel, which we will put in the chat box. Uh, and if you want to engage with us on social media, use hashtag Tuesdays with Team Counterfactual and tag at I Do Impact, which is the Twitter handle for SCB's Impact Evaluation Working Group. If you're not yet a member, you're not yet following, we encourage you to do that. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at I, at I Do Impact. You can sign up for the email list. We'll put this in the chat box uh, so that you can do that. That way you'll get updates on workshops, conference sessions, papers, publications, everything related to impact evaluation and conservation. It's not overwhelming, as very few uh, emails go out. It's a great way to stay connected. So today we have a panel on the challenges and opportunities for implementation science and conservation. We have Sarah Carlson from the US Agency for International Development, Shanique Ranjianari Sua from Conservation International, Sheila Reddy from the Nature Conservancy, and Lina Salazar from the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, and I'm going to do just a brief introduction about what we mean about implementation science. The speaker is going to do very short introductions. We want to spend most of the time uh, on the meat of the substance. Uh, today, if you want to learn more about our speakers, you can Google them. Uh, they all have uh, web profiles. Uh, but if you missed the first webinar in the series that I gave in May. You may not know what we mean by implementation science. We mean in a particular way. We were searching for a phrase that would capture a missing ingredient in conservation that's hindering our ability to develop high quality evidence about the effectiveness of our interventions, the heterogeneity of those, that effectiveness, and the mechanisms through which those interventions are effective. So we borrowed this phrase from medicine or from health. And in that field, it means two different things often. Uh, to this, you know, there are two arms uh, for this implementation science. One is how do we encourage practitioners to take up the practices that have strong evidence about effectiveness? And the second is how do we deliberately design field programs to generate evidence about what works best and under what conditions? And it's that second one that we really are focused on uh, in this webinar series, the panel today. The previous webinar uh, was focused on this idea as well, and it's trying to differentiate what we typically do in conservation from what we ought to be doing more of. And it's deliberately designing some, not all, but some environmental field programs and generate evidence about the effectiveness of different ways of implementing conservation activities in the field. Talking about like evidence about the magnitudes of impacts, when we change how we do conservation, the heterogeneity of those impacts, and the mechanisms through which those impacts are created. Not just talking about does a project work or not, but elements of the project, are these more effective than others, different ways of implementing a project, 
testing underlying assumptions that drive how we design particular programs, how we implement them in lots of different contexts. So if you look at a lot of the webinars this year, most of them were very typical impact evaluation. Someone did a field intervention and someone else, sometimes including the people who did the intervention, try to figure out after the intervention has been launched, is it working in the way in which we think it is, looking at different elements of it, looking for heterogeneity. Here we're talking about what we were talking about in the last webinar is right from the start, making sure these programs are designed to learn something, either about the program or project's effectiveness or some element of it. All right? And there's just briefly, there's just two ways. What are we talking about designing uh, programs deliberately to generate evidence? There's two ways of doing it roughly. You can manipulate the implementation spatially or temporally. The easiest way to think about that is randomizing across space. Some areas will get the intervention, some areas will not, or across time. Who gets it first, who gets it last will actually be at random rather than starting close to roads and moving farther away or close to cities and moving farther away. There are more specialized or fancier or, or creative ways of manipulating implementation, manipulating eligibility scores, for example, that creates variation in where a program is being implemented or how it's being implemented. But roughly all of them are trying to deliberately manipulate the implementation in a way that facilitates learning. The other approach is to do pre-implementation matching, roughly. We saw a bunch of presentations this year where people used matching, often in conjunction with other uh, interventions, to try to find comparison groups that are similar to the intervention groups, whether it be villages or areas or species. And that way we have a better sense of being able to eliminate rival explanations for the patterns that we're seeing. Those matching efforts are always done after the programs were implemented, that can often be challenging. There's no reason we can't do that matching beforehand. So here have a picture of from Erin Sill's presentation on synthetic controls, where she did red projects, R-E-D-D -D projects, after they were implemented, she tried to find other areas where there were no red projects that she could create a synthetic comparison group. There's no reason this can't be done in advance. And that way it's much more likely that we can collect data that can elucidate a lot of the questions we have rather than trying to collect the data later after we can trade, after we create the matching. All right, so that was a very brief introduction. Uh, if you want more on it, you can go to that first webinar, but otherwise I just want to let the panel go because that's what you came here for. Uh, and I'll come back at the end to talk about what's going to be happening next year in this webinar series. So take it away, Joanna. Excellent. Thanks so much for that introduction, Paul. Uh, so I will just start by actually asking the panelists to very briefly uh, introduce themselves. And I thought we could start in alphabetical order. So if I could ask you, Sarah, uh, to go first, and at the same time, I will make sure to uh, pin all of us so that we are visible at the same time for the recorded window. Great. Thanks, Joanna. And it's, it's really great to be here. Um, so I'm Sarah Carlson. I'm a biodiversity and natural resources advisor at the United States Agency for International Development, or USAID. And for those who aren't familiar with AID, we're the US government's foreign assistance body and one of the largest bilateral funders of international conservation. Although within USAID, we're a pretty small sector. Um, so among other jobs at USAID, I lead the evidence team for the biodiversity division, and I spend a lot of my time thinking about how to support evidence-based um, programming, include, including evidence-based design. I work with a lot of great people across the environment sectors at AID, and we've been thinking a lot about how we can support more um, implementation science, uh, science from the vantage point of a, of a funder. So it's great to be here. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us. And next up, uh, Janik, could you give a short introduction about yourself as well? And I will uh, spotlight you for everyone. Okay, um, my name is uh, Janik Kandianoshu. Uh, just uh, call me Janik. Um, my background is forestry, but I like you know, conservation environment in general. Um, I work at Conservation and International, which is a US based uh, NGO, working in a lot of countries in all of the continents. Uh, I'm involved in uh, implementation science since uh, 
2019. And um, I'm also glad to be part of this panel to share what I can share. That's all, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and next up, uh, Sheila. Great. Hi, wonderful to be here, Sheila Reddy. I'm the Senior Director, Conservation Impact at the Nature Conservancy. And um, the Nature Conservancy, we're a nonprofit uh, environmental organization um, working in over 70 countries around the world. And like a lot of organizations, we have goals for biodiversity and climate change. And I lead our monitoring, evaluation and learning program. And we have a couple of responsibilities, primarily related to organizational reporting and learning, and then also around supporting our teams to generate evidence and stand behind our outcomes. Thank you so much and sorry about the hassle with the spotlighting. Uh, and then finally, uh, joining us today is Lina uh, Salazar. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I'm Lina Salazar. I'm a lead economist in the Division of Rural Development and Environment at the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, just for those who don't know about the IDB, uh, we are the, an international financial institution. We are the largest source of financing for development projects in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, we have the headquarters in Washington, D.C., but we work, we have offices in 48 countries in the region. Um, my focus has been on leading uh, impact evaluations on, of agricultural and environmental projects in different countries in, in, uh, in the region and uh, to follow up on the different activities, to design the evaluations, but also to work on the implementation with the governments of the Latin American countries. So it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Thank you so much, uh, everybody, for joining us. And I think we will just jump straight in to make the most of the time we have. Uh, uh, we were brainstorming together with Paul and Seb about how to kind of like really get this uh, going. And we thought to build on the classical wedding game. So if I could all ask all the panelists to bring out the white papers of, uh, 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 paper sheets that you have and then the thick markers. And then if I could ask you to write very briefly the responses. So we have two quick questions. And then after we see all of your uh, uh, answers, we can then elaborate more. So the first question would be, uh, in your opinion, what's the number one challenge to conducting more implementation science in the field of conservation? And I'll just give you a few seconds to think about this and write down your answer. And And I can see that there was a question if the audience can also answer. We will actually have interactive polls just in a moment, but let's get the panel started first. Does it look like you are ready? Uh, yeah. So could I then ask you to show, uh, to show for the audience what you have written? So the number one challenge in your opinion. So we see planning and alignment of project cycles. Uh, related to timing, I guess, adequate resources, lack of demand and political will. I'm actually surprised. These are really quite different. Uh, I, I was, yeah, expecting something different, but let's continue with one more quick question and then we can elaborate these two together. So the second question would be, what's the hardest uh, lesson that you have uh, learned personally uh, uh, that is relevant for implementation science in practice? So just while, while our panelists are uh, thinking very hard and writing down their answers, I guess the way I would like to uh, moderate this panel discussion is to start by uh, focusing on the challenges and then hopefully as we move on, um, see, see this evolving more into what can we learn based on the past and take with us moving towards the future. Um, so that's why we now have a quite heavy focus on the challenges and the, the hard lessons learned. Uh, and I'm very much, uh, very much looking forward to hear what the panelists have to say about that. Uh, 
Does it look like you are ready? No, Sarah is still writing. A few more seconds. I guess we can start showing the papers, the rest of us. So the hardest lesson learned. Implementation plans will change. Be, be prepared to adapt evaluation design on the fly. Lots of learning. There's a need for the right team, the right time, and the right test. And then ex ante design actually matters, is what Lena says. So would anyone like to elaborate a little bit more on your responses and how these, uh, these two questions actually speak to you? I mean, I'm happy to jump in on the on the first question around lack of demand. Um, when we were preparing for the panel, we were talking a little, we were reflecting a bit on, well, where where do we see the most counterfactual uh, designs? And it really for us, it's it's two things. It's when we are committed to outcomes, usually related to people or human well being, as well as climate change and carbon sequestration. And then relatedly, that we have um, partners or funders who are requiring that we uh, use counterfactual um, designs. Anybody else uh, feeling to follow up on that? Please feel free to just turn on the mic. Sure, no, I, I, I agree with Sheila on, on her answer. And I think for me, uh, which is related to the lack of demand is, is the, the lack of political will sometimes. And it can be due to many, several aspects, but I would say that sometimes it's that governments, uh, they don't have the information about what is the importance of doing this type of evaluations. So many times in the bank, we have heard something like, ah, with the cost of the evaluation, we could, uh, support you know 20 more uh, clusters of producers so we could support 20 uh, you know one more coastal area so it's important uh, for us as researchers uh, to try to align our objectives with the objectives of the of the governments and try to convey the message of the importance of doing these evaluations and what are they going to get from it and so this issue is key because sometimes uh, they don't know what they can get from this evaluation and so for us, it's important to tell them, listen, once you have the evaluation, you'll be able to convince the, uh, the, the population of the importance of this type of projects. Sometimes they also need to know, oh, you can present this in a conference, you can present this here. We you know, bring them examples from other projects and try to make it easy for them to understand what's the benefit of the evaluation. And so that can see it not as a cost only, but what can they get from it? And I think that it's key for us to send this message uh, to the governments. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> demand can be driven. Um, like, you know, if you have some policies or regulations and you could, that would drive people to adopt this, uh, um, uh, these techniques. Um, but the reason I say that the number one challenge is the adequate resources, then we had this uh, uh, kind of requirement and also interest in uh, using the implementation science. So we were faced with uh, big challenges, like we didn't really have the adequate resources. Resources means could be money, uh, could be um, staff and a very dedicated staff to that. Um, and apart from that, so the knowledge. So all of that has been, uh, had to be created or built in order to implement it uh, for good. So all of, yeah, all of these points are, are really resonating with me as well. Getting to um, Lena and Sheila's point, um, at USAID, I've seen some sectors use an evaluation use plan. So in addition to having the evaluation, um, they also have a document that describes how it will be used. And so they really think through strategically how that's gonna impact uh, future programming, because as an organization, you know, it doesn't just stop with the specific project. We want to think about how this impacts, like, you know, strategies and, and um, you know, country level strategies or sector strategies, etc. And then, and then for us, um, just from like an, an organizational perspective, I, I put planning and alignment with the project cycle. So we have a very specific project cycle. 
And the evaluation, the impact evaluation needs to be designed alongside the project design. And a lot has to be in place for that to happen. We have to secure funding for, for the work. We have to find a mechanism to access researchers who can do the work. So we either have to find an existing one or we have to procure a new way to access researchers. We have to figure out who among the overstretched USAID staff is going to manage this evaluation and to support them as best as we can. So a lot has to be aligned at a very specific moment in time. And what we've discovered is that we have to make this very easy for it to happen. So we have to streamline the process as much as possible. And, and it's difficult to do with a lot of other you know, competing priorities going on at the same time. So it's not very technically interesting, but it turns out that this sort of structural, these structural issues are, are a big uh, factor uh, for success, at least in, in our context. That's great. I want to just briefly uh, add on to something that Sarah said in terms of thinking about the use and sort of the timing in project cycle or the maturity, say, of a strategy, uh, a really uh, positive trend that we're seeing at the Nature Conservancy is um, some of our regions, in particular Asia Pacific and our uh, Africa region, starting to um, integrate impact evaluations upfront when we have a strategy that we've been doing for some time and we want to scale it. And we're recognizing that we need um, you know, a higher level of evidence to be confident around that scaling. Uh, we feel we need it. And often a donor or funder is also asking for it. But that's a really positive trend uh, where we're seeing more um, internal demand, I would say, for uh, using this type of implementation science as part of our uh, adaptive management and scaling of our strategies. Thank you. And I will have to cut here because I think I would like to move on. So, so far, you, what you've been discussing is quite generic and you would think that these things applies to very many sectors. So, for example, rural development, poverty eradication programs, um, education or, or other types of policies and not necessarily particularly challenging in the context of biodiversity con uh, conservation. And that's why I now have next a poll for the audience. And now again, I would ask the panelists to reflect um, on the pieces of paper. So let me just open it here. The poll uh, should now be open. So to what extent is implementing impact evaluations in conservation actually more challenging than in other sectors? And I think that's why it's really nice to have such a diverse, uh, diverse background of the people on the panel, so you can actually probably build on your previous experiences. And it will be really interesting here now to see what your opinions are, and then we can reflect uh, compared to, to, to people in the, in the audience. So I'll just leave this poll open for a while, and if the panelists can write on their uh, white sheets of paper. So obviously, we have a very simple Likert scale ranging from much more challenging to more challenging to basically the same to less challenging or much less challenging. And I think I will start to close the poll. So final seconds to participate for people in the audience if you still want to take part. We've actually got a big share of you that have uh, responded. So I will end the poll here and share uh, the results. So uh, please let me know, Paul or Seb, if this is not visible for everyone. So uh, uh, I don't think we can see what the audience can see because we're co-hosts. So somebody in the audience, if you can't see the results, please tell us. OK, they can see it. They can see it. Perfect. Then we know that the technology is working. So uh, obviously, it seems that approximately 64% of people in the audience actually do think that the conserva implementing these things in the conservation sector is more challenging than in other sectors. And now I am very curious to see what you have written on your pe pe uh, pieces of paper. So if you could please turn those around.
the same, more challenging, much more or more. Well, this is really interesting. And now I have to say, I, I really want to give the word to Lina, who obviously also has most experience, I assume, from, from other sectors such as, as rural development. Um, what made you respond the way you well, actually, I think I would have thought that a few years ago that it was much more difficult to implement impact evaluations in environmental projects. But uh, we went through COVID and we had experiments with people and vaccines, you know. So, and I bet none of us would have gotten a vaccine that had not been tested before. So, what I thank COVID about, <laughs> there is one thing I have to thank the pandemics is that my job is a lot easier now because I can convince governments of doing this type of evaluations by telling them we did this with people and we did this during a pandemic. So if it's possible to do it during a pandemic, we can do it with other sectors uh, that, uh, you know, that is, is that uh, such as the environmental sector. And I think that has uh, actually an impact on them when you explain them uh, what are the benefits again no, of doing this type of, uh, of analysis? And the issue is to have an ex ante design is key. Uh, even the same that it was done for the vaccines. We had an ex ante design. The scientists did the design for testing this vaccine. So we need to do the ex ante design to convince the government to identify the budget, to identify indicators so that can be measured in the short term, in the medium term, in the long term. So at the end, it's all about the planning and the creativity. Uh, we don't need to all have randomized controlled trials like with the vaccines for the COVID pandemics, but we can have different type of quasi-experimental methods. We can randomize not necessarily at the individual uh, level, but you can randomize at the cluster level, at the geographical level. Uh, anyway, so there, there are many ways to do it. And I think uh, that's why my, my answer has changed over time. This is really inspiring, I have to say. This is this gives hope for the future for all of us, doesn't it? But I think, uh, how about next hearing from Janik, who is actually uh, implementing many of these type of projects on the ground uh, in a very challenging type of socio-political se se uh, setting. So, so Janik, what are your thoughts? Why did you respond that uh, it's much more challenging in conservation? Uh, it seems the uh, you need to unmute yourself. Oh yes, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was, I was even about to put much more challenging because, um, you know, where you have roads, you don't have forests. So when you do some surveys, um, I, I mean, the beneficiary or the target for the study for the survey are really far in remote areas. So that is one thing. And um, these are people who try to flee, you know, the, uh, the control of the government. And uh, so they do not have enough infrastructure, not enough education, so very low level of education. So, you know, when you conduct something there, then you have to really, um, you have a challenge, you know, in formulating the questions and et cetera. So it's very, very uh, difficult. And in those area, um, the culture is really important. So you have, you have lots of day off for culture and have to uh, respect that. So there's a lot of taboo you have to respect. Then this is a challenging for the surveyors when they come there. And also when you talk about conservation, you, are, you deal with sensitive um, information. For instance, um, a local authority um, who is involved in some trafficking, and then it's really hard, you know, to uh, to tell about that in the survey and etc. So that was one thing, um, and also it makes everything really scattered. So in terms of geography uh, and the social uh, cultural aspect, it's very uh, difficult. And then you have on top of that, we have these randomizations of things like. Um, you know, not all the beneficiaries in the same area are gonna get the support that we promised them. Uh, at the same time, some have to wait for one year, two years. And this is not something that is really understandable at the local level. So you have to deal with that. But fortunately for our case, um, relationship, a good relationship with those um, community 
you know, does matter. So this is one way for us that help us a lot to solve this. Yes, yeah, so I guess what I'm hearing is that in a way, is it so that it's more difficult to convince both perhaps high level politicians and policymakers ranging all the way down to local communities about the importance of actually biodiversity conservation compared to perhaps something something as as, as great as, as a vaccine for the COVID uh, virus. Uh, Sheila or Sarah, any thoughts on on the how particular the conservation context is? Yeah, I, I I really like Lena's answer. So I'm I'm hoping I'm going to be there in a, in a couple couple of years as well. So I I put it was um, in conservation. It's just more more challenging, and, and that's simply because of the data that we're interested in, sort of the dependent variable. So for example, my colleagues at, in the in the health and the food security sector, they they do a lot of household surveys, and so that's sort of the the data that they're that they're collecting. But for us, it's biophysical measurement ultimately, right? Which there are some challenges with that. We don't have a lot of systems in place that allow us to do that um, easily for all contexts. So we're kind of like reinventing the wheel with each evaluation. Um, I guess it's getting a bit easier with geospatial uh, data if that's, you know, applies to your context. But if you're looking at, at species or, um, you know, issues like connectivity or or ecosystem function. You know, it's a it's a more interesting biological issue that that we're dealing with and 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 trying to figure out. So that's why I put it as as more. And then also there's the issue of time. So it might take longer to recognize a change in those biophysical measurements, right? And so there are ways that we pair that with like. For example, a threat reduction um, type of, of outcome to sort of get to that like medium term result. So, so that's why I, I chose my answer. Great. And I ended up, I was going to say more, and then I decided to say much more um, for the reasons that we discussed earlier, plus exactly what Sarah is saying about the measurement of the outcomes. So I won't I won't add to that, but uh, my additional reason um, is around replication. So a lot of our strategies um, essentially they we don't replicate them in sort of similar context. Um, now there are certainly exceptions, right? Say when we're doing work around sustainable agriculture or forestry, uh, those are great examples where we are working with a relatively large population um, but then there's a lot of really interesting strategies that we do that involve um, policy and innovative finance when you know they weren't it were really limited in the number of places that we're doing that and so it's a lot harder to um, take this approach that said i don't think it's entirely limited i think there's ability to break down particular aspects of what we're doing and um, design those with counterfactual analyses. Maybe it's obviously not the whole of the strategy. You have to kind of small, smallify what you're doing and identify, okay, what would be a helpful question within that? Um, even in the cases where we do have um, larger populations that we're working with, it, uh, we can um, integrate a counterfactual design. Um, sometimes we run into an issue where we're worried that we're going to actually interact with essentially uh, uh, too much of the population. Like it's too risky from the perception of the practitioners. And I'll provide a real example there. Actually collaborating with uh, Paul a few years back, we were working in the U.S. Um, corn belt, uh, so the, the middle of the United States, uh, where there's a lot of corn and soy production. And we were trying to encourage um, non-operating landowners, so people who rent their lands to farmers to adopt conservation practices. And we were starting out first with a messaging experiment to recruit people into the program. And when we did our power analysis, we were starting to see that we were going to be reaching something like 30% of that population, which really raised some concerns um, to our practitioner partners because they need to work in this you know, environment. Um, in that case, we did actually end up moving forward, and uh, but we, we got a strong cap on, don't try and touch more than that, 
percentage of the population. So I thought that was that was a pretty interesting um, lesson about essentially, is this a safe test in the sense that doing a test can create some risk to working in an area? And I think that th this is actually naturally leading into my next, like on to towards my next question, which would be, what are the key elements that we need to get right in conservation? So what can we build on for the future? And here I would really hope that you could share uh, anything ranging from really project level success stories to then perhaps like, you know, something that at the organization or a really higher structural level, you think are the, the, the key elements that we really need to make sure that we get right uh, in order to actually be able to see some progress in terms of this ever, uh, evidence revolution in, in conservation science. And I think uh, Shanik is very much still with us, but in order to save the bandwidth for the internet, he turns off the camera here and there. Uh, so I will just spotlight you again, Janik, whenever you want to join us with video. Anyone? No, we're supposed to be writing this down. No need to write this down. So this is really just more kind of freely elaborating. So yeah. Uh, feel free to just uh, open your mic and start answering. So, so key key elements that we need to get right. What 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 success stories have you seen? Or then, what are the absolute failures that we definitely can learn a lot from? So, I, I can start with the, with a few. There's probably a lot. So, so one which has already been mentioned several times is a real culture of learning, and related to that is comfort with failure. Right. So, there's a lot of incentives to report success stories, right, to the donor or to Congress or whatever, you know, uh, leadership. Um, but, you know, it's important for this work um, that everyone is comfortable with failure. Our interventions may not be working. From an organizational perspective, that's just as interesting as the ones that do work, right, because we want to be making good, good investments. Um, and so that requires a very high level of trust. And so at the beginning of these endeavors, I feel like that when I, where I've seen that tone established from the beginning, it's gone a long way uh, to, to leading to, to successful um, implementation science activities. So I think that that's really key. Um, another sort of bureaucratic one is um, a way to, to increase the um, sort of bridge the research implementation gap. So, you know, throughout this webinar series, I discovered all these great researchers working on these questions, right? And so my thought is like, oh gosh, like how do we get access to these folks and like have them folded into our, our procurement systems and things like that. So, so sort of a community or a professionalization of the people that do this kind of work. And then um, a way to, to um, to work with donors and other organizations in a way that's that's easy, that makes it easy. I would see that as, as being another really important element. And I'll stop there. Yeah, if I if I may uh, jump in, I completely agree with Sarah. We need to be more comfortable uh, facing failure because it's part of research. So when we just focus on the successful stories, this is going to create a bias and on itself. So we need to be able to be to feel comfortable and to kind of change the culture within the organizations that we just need to focus on what is working well. Because the things that are not working are very important to identify. No? And we need to know what is not working and what is working. So I think that's key. I also wanted to mention that um, one point that is, is very important, I think, is, is the, the for donors to require uh, having this impact evaluation. So uh, at the bank, for instance, we have this checklist that we, ha uh, we, we have to, every project, uh, every team project, they have to fill this checklist before it's been approved by the board. And we're talking about projects of hundreds of millions of dollars sometimes, where they have to make sure that they have a plan for an impact evaluation for all of the projects that are being financed by the bank in education, in health, in transportation, in environment, in agriculture. So we have a checklist. Uh, so does the project have indicators uh, that are measurable? Does the project have a baseline uh, 
um, the, 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 yeah, the, the, the plan for collecting a baseline? Does it have the budget for the impact evaluation? So all of these checklists is kind of like the pilots when they get in the plane, they check if they have everything before taking off. So we do the same. We need to check this list. And if the project doesn't fulfill many of these requirements, they are not going to be able to be approved by the board. So I think the fact that the bank uh, committed to create more uh, you know, evidence on, on the impact of the projects on their effectiveness, it has created a culture inside the bank that now is normal. At the beginning, everybody was panicking. Everybody, that was 10, 12 years ago when I started at the bank and people were like, this is impossible. We can't convince the governments. And now we see that it's becoming part of the culture. Everybody knows we have to do an impact evaluation or at least to try to do an impact evaluation. And if it doesn't work, okay, we know it doesn't work. And, and the last thing I, I think uh, is important to mention is also to have intermediate indicators. Because as uh, some of you pointed out, some of the indicators uh, or the dependent variable that uh, Sheila was talking about, they take time to develop in the, in the environmental science. But it happens as well with education. You know, while you get educated and then when you receive income, it takes years to develop, right? Uh, so, so the time frame is, is also a, a long-term um, concern, uh, you know, for different sectors. But in the case of uh, conservation, I think we need to focus on identifying more intermediate indicators. For instance, we have this project at the bank in Peru. It was a, a fruit fly project. And of course, I couldn't randomize, uh, you know, the, the, the producers to, to get into this, uh, to adopt a good agricultural and environmental practices because the fly would jump from one place to the other. So it was impossible to do a randomized controlled trial. It had to be a sweep. Uh, we have to sweep regions of the country that were treated with, with, the, with the training to, to understand more about this, this uh, fruit fly. And of course, it takes time to, uh, to know the prevalence of the, of the, of the plague in, in a specific region. So what we did was to uh, implement a test. So we went to the different producers and to the different, uh, yeah, the, we went to interview the producers and we test their knowledge on how to implement these practices. So we were able to show the government, okay, we don't have the final result right now, but we have some indication that the project is going in a, in, in, in a good path, right? So the, the government was like, oh, okay, I see that this is working and I can show something. So I think that's as well very important to try to identify short-term indicators that we can uh, show and that we can, um, uh, yeah, we can show to the donors and we can show to the government so that they get more motivated. Thank you. And I am sure everyone would be really keen to keep uh, talking about this, but I see that we are uh, 15 minutes till the end and I really want to make sure that we have enough time also for the audience to engage with you. So at this stage, I will uh, just open the final poll that we have, uh, where then the, uh, the people in the audience can also participate. And, and I'm hoping with this to kind of move the discussion more towards the future. So building on these things, what are the key elements? What, what are the factors we need to get right? What can we learn? Uh, moving more to the future. Let me just open the poll here. Uh, and then again, if I could ask the panelists to write these down on your final sheet uh, of paper. So in how many years do you think that we will see regularly uh, that conservation projects are deliberately designed in ways that facilitate counterfactual learning, such as we have already seen for perhaps a, a bit more than a decade in development projects? And people are still participating. I thought we can do this quick, but yeah, we'll give you a few more seconds to post your answer. Uh, no need to overthink, just the intuitive feeling that you have. So I think I will end it here, um, share the results. Uh, so it seems that the majority, uh, a little bit more than half of the people in the audience actually think that 10 years, a decade seems to be approximately uh, what might be needed for, for this in conservation. How about the panelists? Could you just quickly uh, show your papers? 
10, five to 10 years. Well, I will actually uh, end my part uh, of this panel with, with this positive note. Hopefully this will move faster than what we might have, have been uh, anticipating. And then I open the floor for Seb uh, to moderate the Q&A session. Perfect. So that was so so inspiring and so interesting to see to hear about all these different uh, perspectives. Um, and uh, the audience has a lot of questions uh, in the chat. Uh, so so I'm gonna try to select some of those and just for um, maybe just as a starter, uh, Paul Ferrara has actually a question for the um, for the audience and is basically asking uh, sorry for the um, panelists and is asking you. Do you think that all field interventions should be evaluated or should we invest strategically on in evaluation? And I guess the implicit way is like, what, what is the more strategic? I mean, what are the criteria to select what is more strategic to evaluate? If, if some panelists want to um, take that bait. Do we have to evaluate all Sure, I'm happy to speak to this one. Um, I think definitely we want to be investing strategically in our evaluations. And um, uh, we spoke to this earlier, you know, I think we think about um, is there a time when we're wanting to try to scale an effort? And so we want to really be more confident that the intervention is leading to the desired outcomes or probably more likely some promising um early indicators or intermediate results. And then also you know, when there's you know, more of a risk related to unverified outcomes. So certainly, um, I mean, that can be lots of things, but I feel like often we're thinking about um, outcomes for human well-being or carbon sequestration where there's a little higher burden of proof. Um, I'll also add on that, I think, I like to kind of step back a bit um, and think about sort of a maturity of um, our conservation strategies and how implementation science might change in terms of the methods we use sort of throughout different stages of maturity. So a lot of our work might start out as really more of an idea, you know, and we, I think, need more rapid ways of testing components of that idea and it might not make sense to use a really rigorous approach, but we still wanna have a learning orientation. And then once I think you know, you, you've got some promising results, you've worked out some aspects of feasibility, uh, then you might be heading more to like some real validating. And that's when I think we wanna be integrating more rigorous counterfactual design. So, I feel like that's a really important part of this message here is that um, there's a lot of work that that needs to be done kind of early to give yourself yourself that confidence that there's something promising there uh, that's worth a more rigorous test. So I'll just um, jump in here quickly and and agree with what Sheila said. So I saw someone put in the chat the, the Zelder-Solowski paper, and I think that is a good framework. We use a similar thing at AID. So um, if we tried to do impact evaluations with all of our projects, we would lose our goodwill immediately. <laughs> so, so absolutely not. But for those really big investments, I think it's appropriate. For pilot or innovative approaches, it is, um, at, you know, risky activities, as, as Sheila mentioned. And I want to throw another one out there, which is that these common interventions that we support over and over and over again in conservation that have a very weak evidence base. It doesn't mean that they don't work. It just means we haven't taken the time to, to collect the evidence. So, for example, alternative livelihood approaches, right? We use that all the time, and there's very little evidence of when it's effective. Yeah, I, I'd like to um, jump on that as well. Uh, I think all intervention, field interventions should be uh, evaluated because we need to um, do lessons. We need to improve. Uh, so we need to evaluate what went well, what didn't go well. And we draw lessons from that. And then we 
build on the best practice for the future, and we will not repeat things that did not work. But the question is how, at what level, what resources are we going to um, uh, put on that? So it depends on the size of the project and its scale. So uh, I, I would say for a big um, project or program, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really important to, to, to do that um, as good as possible. Sebastian, we can hear you. Yep. So no, thank you. Um, thank you uh, to the panelists. Maybe in the interest of time, uh, we will have probably opportunity just for uh, another um, question, uh, the last question. And, and I, have pro, pro, uh, I have one from uh, Christo. And, and he's asking basically a very simple question. How many implementing agencies uh, or, or donors or NGO are, are actually enthusiastic? about um, rigorous evaluation of the promising outcome. So how do we build on enthusiasm or create uh, enthusiasm? And that will be very likely one of our concluding um, question for, for you panelists. Yeah, if, I, if, I, if I may answer. Um, so what, I, what I've perceived uh, from the multilateral donors and from other agencies is that more and more is becoming more uh, is becoming more they are becoming more enthusiastic about uh, uh, implementing impact evaluations because resources are scarce so they want to be able to finance interventions that have uh, you know some some evidence of uh, being effective so for instance of course at the bank we we need to have an evaluation for every project uh, if we don't have an evaluation at the end of the project, the project gets penalized. So it's something that governments, they, 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 you know, they, they understand that the importance of, of working on this, uh, generating some evidence. I'm not talking about a randomized control trial every time, which is not possible, but at least trying to learn something from the project. And that I agree with Janet and what he mentioned before. We need to evaluate every project, even if it's not in the most rigorous way. And Recently, also, we've gotten more enthusiasm as well from the GEF, uh, um, from the Global Environmental Facility. We are an implementing agency for, for, for them. And they are also uh, being more and more uh, interested in, on understanding uh, how can we uh, you know, potentially implement this type of evaluations in their projects as well. So I, I see uh, also from governments. Governments are becoming uh, more enthusiastic about this type of tools. Because uh, you see that uh, you see you can see examples from 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 other countries that they they, they would like to to show as well the the progress on different areas. So I think uh, it's, it's it's very you know uh, positive uh, to see this enthusiasm growing over time. You're muted, Seb. Anybody else has seen this enthusiasm growing or, or Lina is the head of the curve on, on many of these? Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I, I think there, there's a trend towards that right now. Uh, for the case of Conservation International, for instance, um, I'm, I'm talking about the safeguards, the environmental and social safeguards. We were kind of doing that um, depending on the requirements of the uh, funder, but now from 2023 uh, 20, uh, onwards, all project has to undergo this, uh, has to take into account that and has to be evaluated against that. So that's the policy at Conservation International right now. Since the implementation science is a kind of new uh, area, so maybe it would take some time for it to be fully adopted, but I think uh, I believe that the way it works now is that it's going to be uh, adopted sooner or uh, later. Uh, I'll just okay. add, um, 
to that as well. Yeah, I, I definitely see enthusiasm growing um, at USAID. And I would say in the US government in general, we have a very supportive culture for this type of work, a supportive policy culture for this work. Uh, mm -hmm. We have an evaluation policy, a scientific research policy. The agency has a risk appetite statement, which sort of encourages taking risks and, and evaluating them. Um, we have an, a U.S. government-wide evidence-based policymaking act, which is a law. So we have a very supportive structure for this work. But it's important to note that that organizations are not monolithic. So there's a lot of different components, and it does not always trickle down to all parts of the agency, right? And so the barriers that I see um, are largely these sort of structural management burden, uh, resource issues. They're sort of down there at a, at a lower scale, even if the political will is there. If you can overcome those constraints at kind of the day-to-day -day level, I think um, I think that would that would help a lot and help the enthusiasm grow if we make this work uh, easier to do. Great. So I'm going to interrupt because we only have a couple of minutes left. Uh, I want to thank the, the panelists for an outstanding panel. And I think particularly because as the organizers, we wanted to make sure that you and the audience go away at least partial optimists that this is possible. So I'm going to view that poll as most people think 10 years or fewer that we'll be having this more regularly. And I hope you all go back to your institutions uh, and, and advocate for at least some of the field interventions that your organizations are doing or that you're associated with are, are used as vehicles for trying to get a better handle on how we can better implement conservation actions uh, in the field. And I just want to tell everybody that our next seminar, we're going to take a break in January. Our next seminar is going to be the first Tuesday again, starting in February. We're finalizing the speaker list. If you're already registered, you'll get information and updates about this. But we hope to have the webinar continue from February uh, through December with a break in the summer, just like we had uh, this year. So thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, and we hope to see you next year. Have a great holiday break and winter break or summer break, depending on where you are.